Amen. Well, if you have a Bible and you can open it with me to, to Esther chapter 6, we're doing a series right now, going through the book of Esther, and it's a book that helps us to recognize that sometimes God feels absent. In the entire story of Esther, God is never specifically mentioned, and so we need books like this to remind us that when things are hard and evil abounds, God is still at work. Though we might not see him, though we might not discern him, he is actively at work in the world. So let's go ahead and read Esther chapter 6, starting in verse 1, then I'll pray and we will get to work. Esther chapter 6, starting in verse 1, that night the king could not sleep, so he ordered the book of the Chronicles, the record of his reign, to be brought in and read to him. It was found recorded there that Mordecai had exposed Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's officers, who had guarded the doorway, who had conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. What honor and recognition has Mordecai received for this, the king asked. Nothing has been done for him, his attendants answered. The king said, who's in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the palace to speak to the king about impaling Mordecai on the pole he had set up for him. The king's attendants answered, Haman is standing in the court. Bring him in, the king ordered. When Haman entered, the king asked him, what should be done for the man the king delights to honor? Now Haman thought to himself, who is there that the king would rather honor than me? So he answered the king, for the man the king delights to honor, have them bring a royal robe the king has worn and a horse the king has ridden one with a royal crest placed on its head. Then let the robe and the horse be entrusted to one of the most, to, to the king's most noble princes and let them robe the man the king delights to honor and lead him on the horse through the city streets proclaiming before him, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. Go at once, the king commanded. Get the robe and the horse and do just as you have suggested for Mordecai the Jew, who sits at the king's gate. Do not neglect anything you have recommended. So Haman got the robe and the horse. He robed Mordecai and led him on horseback through the city streets, proclaiming before him, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. Afterward, Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman rushed home with his head covered in grief and told Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends everything that had happened to him. His advisors and his wife Zeresh said to him, Since Mordecai, before whom your downfall has started, is of Jewish origin, you cannot stand against him. You will surely come to ruin. While they were still talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried him on away to the banquet Esther had prepared. Let's pray. Lord, we ask right now that you would speak over us, Lord, that we would hear your voice loud and clear, that through this word, by your spirit, you would speak. Lord, help us to be your people for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'd like to look at this uh, as really three lessons that this teaches us about um, uh, things like this, idolatry, things like idolatry, things like providence and things like God's deliverance. And so we're going to look at them one at a time. But just to kind of set the stage, if you've not been tracking with us over these previous weeks, uh, you might not know who these characters are or what's going on behind the scenes, but um, Haman is one of the royal officials, and he has been elevated to a place of status. And one of the laws that was written about him was whenever he's walking through an area and somebody sees him, the, the law actually says everyone has to bow down to him and pay him respect and honor. And that uh, is the case, and everyone is doing that except for Mordecai. Mordecai is of Jewish descent, and Mordecai is one of the, uh, he, also a royal official, but when he sees Haman, he, he refuses to bow down and worship him. And so that upsets Haman so badly that Haman is like, I'm going to do something not only about this guy, but all of his people, all of the Jews, and all of the 127 provinces that Persia rules over. And so um, Esther is the uh, niece of Mordecai, and she actually is queen, but nobody knows that she's of Jewish descent yet. 
And so there's already been a little interchange where Esther was kind of suggested, you, you need to go to the king and plead for the king's favor. And so she's willing to do that, and she uh, doesn't know how that's going to play out, but she holds a banquet, and the king and Haman are both there, and she's getting prepared to make that incredible request. And then she says, okay, guys, let's come back again. Here's, I'll tell you what my request is, but let's come back tomorrow and hold another banquet, and at that banquet, I will reveal my request. So we pick it up then in chapter 6 between those two banquets. And what we find are these three lessons then. Well, the first one that I want to spend some time on is idolatry. Idolatry. Idolatry is the worship and service of a created thing. It's, it's a worship and service of something created rather than the creator God, as Romans 1 puts it. And this is something that is just a, a feature of the human experience. It's kind of how God made us. We are, in the words of Harold Best, we are unceasing worshipers. It's God made us that way. So Harold Best says it's not a matter of if somebody worships, it's a matter of what they worship. It's just how we're wired. We're always, we're always worshiping, we're always serving, we're always doing these different things. Now the problem is we often replace worship and service of the one true God to worshiping and serving something else, all kinds of different things. And so uh, that that is sin. That is a sin to do that. And so we need to ask the question, how would we ever identify what our idols might be? And there's a handful of different ways to go about this, but one of the ways that you could identify an idol in your life is actually found in our story, and it goes something like this. If you could have something, if you could have anything you had a blank check, so to speak, to just have life go your way, if you had a magic wand that you could wave and you could get exactly what you wanted, how would you fill that out? What are are the things that you are most desiring of? If you could just kind of imagine your life, money wasn't an issue, convincing other people wasn't an an issue, If if you could just have your way, how is it that you would describe that preferred future? Now, that's what happens in our story here. Verse 6, when Haman entered the court, the king asked him, what should be done for the man the king delights to honor? And he assumes, who else would the king want to honor other than me? I'm the most important person around here. So obviously, this is kind of a veiled request. This is him kind of letting me know, I can just ask him whatever I want in this moment. And he fills it out. He's got a blank canvas to paint a picture of his preferred future. And how does he describe it? He describes it in terms of public adoration. Verses 7 and 9. For the man the king delights to honor, have them bring a royal robe the king has worn and a horse the king has ridden, one with the royal crest placed on his head. Then let the robe and the horse be entrusted to one of the king's most noble princes and let them robe the man the king delights to honor and lead him on the horse through the city streets, proclaiming before him, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. If you're pressing him on, what do you most want in life? He fills it out this way. I want everybody to see me as important. I, I want to I be paraded through the streets of the city with everyone looking at me and somebody marching before me, leading the horse that I'm riding on, saying, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. He, he, he's wrapped up in public adoration. Now, we've already seen that in previous chapters. We've seen how this has affected him. This is something that he wants so badly that when it is threatened, it ruins his life. That's another way that you can identify an idol. He wants people to bow down to him. He wants people to pay him respect and deference and honor. And when one person will not do that, what happens? He's enraged. And he actually, in the previous chapter, he sits down with his friends and he goes, I have all this stuff going great in my life. All this wealth, all this resource, all these resources, all of this power, but that Mordecai won't bow down to me. I, it spoils the whole thing. It ruins everything else. And that's the language of idolatry. I have to have this, and if I can't, it ruins my life. So one of the ways that we might identify our own idols is to think through, if we had a blank canvas and we could just paint the picture of our lives in the way that we most want them, and then to think through, if that doesn't come true, how do we respond to that? We're, now we're in the realm of idolatry. So we need to be willing to look at our own hearts because this teaches us something 
about idolatry. Thomas Chalmers was a Scottish minister in uh, the early 1800s, and he wrote a treaty called The Expulsive Power of a New, Effect- a new Affection. It's, like an, it's an article, and it's a, it's a really beautiful article. It's old, it's archaic. I don't suggest you hop online and go try to read it right now, but it's this beautiful article about, the, the, about idolatry. And one of the things that Chalmers is noting is that our hearts are designed to long after things. This is how God built us. We love stuff, and we, our hearts are drawn to them, and that's a normal and natural thing, but they are often drawn to the inordinate worship of things other than God, idolatry. And the point of the article is we cannot simply decide, I'm going to stop doing that. Like if you identify an idol, you can't just say, okay, guys, I'm going to quit that today says that's not how it works. You can't simply discard a desire. That's not possible. Instead, what Chalmers is saying is you actually have to replace it. You have to take this desire for something and recognize that in order to to do away with that, you would need to replace that with a greater desire. That's the title of the article, The Expulsive Power of a New Affection. If you want to deal with an idol, you have to actually find something greater that you could worship. And Chalmers says, this happens quite naturally. This is something that we just normally do. And he gives an illustration of how it can progress in the life of an individual. So he talks about a child. When you're a child, you have these immature desires, immature appetites. But then when you grow into young adulthood, it changes. So you could go from having these immature appetites for something, but then as you get older, all of a sudden you've replaced it with a desire for wealth or status, and then you, you keep changing them, and you keep going up and up and up, so to speak, in the way in which you trade out your idols. I'll, let's just make it a little bit more plain. My son Harrison is going to have a birthday this week. He'll be seven years old. And uh, as a child, he has certain things that he longs for. Actually, a lot of things. That he longs for. If he's on Amazon, he's just hearting everything. Um, but one of the things that makes him happy right now is a, a Happy Meal. A, a crummy little, you know, chicken nugget garbage meal, but it has a toy in it. And it makes him incredibly happy. But as he's getting older, his appetites are changing. And so if I were to say, okay, dude, which one do you want? Do you want a Happy Meal or do you want Ninja Chicken from JMK? He's starting to go in that direction now. He's starting to upgrade the things that he likes, correct? Now, that happens with us quite naturally. We keep exchanging these lesser idols for greater idols. Now, the point of the article that Chalmers is getting to is if we really want to deal with an idol, we have to replace it with something so great that it could properly order all the other desires of our hearts. If you want to deal with idolatry, you actually have to get to a point where you're able to say, what I most worship and serve is the greatest thing in all of creation. I, what we need to get to the point of, of doing is saying that we worship and serve the one true and living God, and he is so great and worthy of our adoration and worthy of our service and wor- worthy of our dedication of our lives, and we're, we're serving him, we're worshiping him, and that means that every other desire that we have is rightly prioritized. It's subjected to the reality of love for God. That's what we need to do. Now, we see it in a way, we see it in our text. We see what happens when somebody is unaffected by an idol. Now, Haman, after the events of the day, what happens to him? He goes home with his head covered and he's devastated. That was for me. That's what I wanted. And it was given to my enemy. And he goes home wrecked by it. But how does that whole experience affect Mordecai? Look at verse 12. Afterward, after the public display of affection for him, after he's marched through the city streets, after Haman is crying out, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor, what does he do? Afterward, Mordecai returned to the king's gate. It's said set, it's set in such a way where, where, where it almost feels like he's unaffected by it. Doesn't like pull people together and have a press conference and go, hey, this is the greatest day of my life. This was a wonderful gesture of kindness. What an incredible reward for what I did for the king previously. This is amazing. No, no, no. It just feels like he's unmoved by it. He he gets the, the thing that Haman most wanted, and he gets it on full display, and it doesn't even seem to change him. 
Now, that's the kind of thing that I'm after here when we think about the world in which we're living. I would love it if Christians were people who were, who were so in love with God and so in love with what God were up to that the lesser things would be rightly prioritized. Over the past couple of years, I've hopefully made a point of saying this again and again. One of the things that I note is this political idolatry that's present in many, many places and many of our hearts even. And what I want to do is I want to get to a place where we are so enamored with God, so in love with God, so worshiping of God that these lesser realities are rightly put in their place. And therefore, when things do not go the way that we think they maybe should, when things do not go according to the plan in which we might spell out or the picture in which we might paint, we're unaffected by it. We're not easily shaken by it because we are trusting in God. So this teaches us about idolatry, and it's a very, very important lesson for us to consider. Well, secondly, it teaches us about providence. And providence is the idea that God is at work in the world that he made, that he didn't just create it and wind it up and set it free and go, I wonder how this is going to play out. But he's actively involved in the world in which he made, and he is at work orchestrating and maneuvering and positioning and doing things in order to accomplish his good purposes. Now, this chapter is kind of a turning point in the whole story, but if you look at the details of it, you could read it as mere coincidence, that there are things that are happening coincidentally, but once you begin to stack them up, you come to a profound conclusion. This is not mere coincidence. This is not mere happenstance. This is by design that these events unfolded in such a way that it was according to somebody's plan. Let's look at them briefly. If you look at the, the start of this chapter, it just so happens that the king couldn't sleep. Now, that's not always a noteworthy thing. I couldn't sleep on Friday night. That's not worthy of just kind of drawing attention to it. There are a lot of times where you have a night and you just can't sleep. But on this particular night, it just so happens that the king can't sleep. And what's significant about it is, is it's on this particular night. So verse 1 starts out that way. That night, the king could not sleep. Well, what are we talking about here? It's the night between the two banquets. It's the night between the, you know, the first encounter with Esther and Haman and their meal together and the king saying, Esther, whatever you want, I'll give it to you up to half the kingdom. And the second banquet, which will happen later this day, um, where Esther will make it plain what's going on behind the scenes. So it, it just so happens that the king couldn't sleep, but it just so happens to be on this particular night. And that's a significant detail. And it just so happens that the king chooses to have the chronicles read, the, the record book of his reign. Out of, this is the king of Persia. So out of all the things he could have done to try to you know, entertain himself that night or put himself back to sleep. He says, okay, guys, here's what we're going to do tonight. Bring out the record book, the rule of my reign, and read it to me. So it just so happens that that's the plan today, that this is how he's going to deal with his sleepless night. And it just so happens that as they're reading it, they come across the record of an event that happened four years previous, where there were two servants of the king who were plotting to assassinate the king, and Mordecai... Mordecai found out about that plot and then revealed that plot and prevented the execution of the king. So it just so happens that he's sleepless on this particular night, and it just so happens that he has this book read, and then it just so happens that they land on this page, and he finds out about this event, and he goes, okay, well, what was done for Mordecai? How did we reward him? How did we repay him for that kindness? And they say, well, actually, we haven't. We didn't do that yet. And he goes, okay, well, we got to do something about that right now. Who is in the court? In other words, he's saying, which of my royal officials is available to me right now? It'd be like the president saying, hey, who's in the West Wing today? Let's get them in here so that we can have a conversation and decide what we could do for Mordecai, this man who saved my life. And it just so happens that at that very moment, Haman is showing up. They're like, he's like, who's in, the, who's in the court today? And they say, well, this is interesting. Haman isn't scheduled to come in until later, but I guess he's just kind of eager to get to work today, so he just showed up. It just so happened that Haman showed up. Now, Haman is there for a very different reason. Haman is there because he wants to execute Mordecai. He's so mad at Mordecai and his unwillingness to bow down to him 
that when he talked to his friends about it, they said, here's what you ought to do. Build a 75 cubit tall pole, this spike, and then have Mordecai executed on it. Have him hung on it tomorrow morning. So Haman showing up, that's what he's about to say. Hey, king, can I do something today? This is very important to me. But it just so happens that at that moment, he walks into that court and the king is saying, which of my royal officials is here so that we can do something about Mordecai who saved my life? This is not mere coincidence. This is by design. So when we look at these events, we recognize that God is at work here and he is, re- he is reversing the fortunes of God's people. That at the start of the chapter, you've got Mordecai and it feels like he's about to die. That Haman is working a plan to execute him. But at the end of the chapter, what do you have? You have him being elevated and exalted. At the start of the chapter, you you still feel this, this heaviness of death hanging over the heads of all of God's people. But by the end of the chapter, you begin to realize the, the, the working of evil is being undone. And you begin to recognize this is the hand of God. And the friends of Haman recognize that as well. Look at verse 13. He goes home sad and he told Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends everything that had happened to him. His advisors and his wife Zeresh said to him, since Mordecai, before whom your downfall has started, is of Jewish origin, you cannot stand against him. You will surely come to ruin. So here's what they're doing. They're looking at all of these details and they're going, this is no accident. Now now we're recognizing you are fighting against God. And there is no way that you're going to win in this one. It is before this man, Mordecai, and his God, the God of the Israelites, that you are going to come to ruin. So Ian DeGuid puts it like this, God's work of providence is so clear that even the pagans cannot miss its significance. Even Haman's friends are not so dense as to write off this day's events as mere coincidence. They know that all this must be attributed to the intervention of Israel's God, And that once that God becomes involved in the world, the final outcome is never in doubt. When you begin to recognize God is at work behind the scenes, coordinating things according to his will and his purposes, all of a sudden we're we're in the realm of recognizing God's providence as this thing that should instill confidence in us. God is at work. So we we need to think through the fact that God is still doing these very things. He's still at work providentially doing things in our world. He's at work even in the smallest details of your life. On those nights where you're sleepless and and you, you might feel like, oh, this is just a wasted night. No, maybe God is doing something that you cannot even perceive. And those small little choices that you're making and those kind of mundane little things about your life, there is significance there because God is providentially at work in your life and he is able to make beautiful things happen. Karen Jobes puts it like this, God providentially directs the flow of human history through the ordinary lives of individuals to fulfill the promises of his covenant. What a great God we serve. Any deity, any God worth his salt can do a miracle now and then. Our God, our God is so great, so powerful that he can work without miracles through the ordinary events of billions of human lives through millennia of time to accomplish his eternal purposes. Here's what Job's is saying. God is able to work in even the smallest details of our lives that at first glance might seem insignificant. And yes, he's able to sometimes break in in a dramatic way and part a Red Sea or raise the dead or do something profound and and exceptional. But here's what's also incredible about this God. He is at work in your lives, even in those small and imperceptible details. He is at work. He is working all things together for good, for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. So the providence of God is a helpful doctrine. It helps us to recognize God's activity in our lives. And and hopefully, we're able to begin to discern that even if we don't understand how it all adds up, he's still at work. Well, let's look finally at deliverance. We learn a lesson here about the deliverance of God. And the first thing that I note is that it comes from God. Deliverance comes from God. God. 
Commentators point this out. They, they note that Esther, the hero of our story, is not even in this chapter. And Mordecai is just a, just a passive individual in this part of the story. Significant things are happening, but nobody is making it happen. No individual is making it happen. Here's, here's why. It's because deliverance is actually coming from God. Now, I'm not saying that we just need to kick our feet up and practice inactivity and trust that God's going to make it all better. No, no, no. The whole story points in a different direction. We have to fast and pray and plan and act wisely. But at the end of the day, what we are able to say as believers is, our deliverance comes from God. Not us twisting God's arm to get something done, but our deliverance comes from God himself. The late Ed Clowney, when he was pressed on the most important passage in the Bible, he actually said, well, it's found in the belly of a fish. Uh, he looked to the book of Jonah and to the prayer there, and he said, this is his opinion, but I think it's pretty, pretty right on. He, he says his favorite verse and the most important verse in the Bible for him is when Jonah prays this way, salvation belongs to the Lord. When you begin to recognize that deliverance comes from God, he says that's really the heart of the Bible. When we look at this story and we, we think through how God's at work, we can, we can come to this conclusion. God is able to deliver. And therefore, we look to him for the work that he's doing. Deliverance comes from God. And deliverance is a reversal of situations. We've already mentioned this, but Mordecai is about to be killed. Death is hanging over the head of all of God's people in all the provinces. And evil is ramping up. And when we get to this part of the story, we just feel like it's going to go very, very poorly. But deliverance looks like this. God turns it on its head. All of a sudden, Mordecai is no longer about to be executed. He's being exalted. He's being paraded as the man the king delights to honor. Death and evil are, are being undone now. We begin to get a sense that God is at work and, and those evil plans will not prevail. So deliverance is a reversal of plight. And deliverance is obviously a personal experience for Mordecai, but that's not the main point here. I mean, yes, we should take comfort in the fact that God can look at our lives and he can look at the things that we're going through and he can say, okay, this isn't great, so I'm going to step in here and I'm going to do something. And he often does that. He takes care of his children and we, we, we love that. We love how God is at work on our behalf. But the, the story actually kind of gets us into a bigger realm of his deliverance. The story actually gets us into the, what the children's Bibles say. When, when we give out Bibles around here, we, we talk about the biggest story. And our lives just need to be located in the grand story of what God is doing in human history. And this chapter gets us there. It actually shows up in verse 13. The advisors of Haman and his wife Zeresh said to him, Since Mordecai, before whom your downfall has started, is of Jewish origin... You cannot stand against him. You will surely come to ruin. Now, it's easy to miss this because in the NIV that I'm working off of, they, they carry it across a little different. They say he's of Jewish origin. But the actual phrase there is that he is of the seed. It's a weird thing, and that's why we don't have it in the NIV because we, that's a little confusing to us. But it says that Mordecai, before whom your downfall has started is of the seed. And that gives us this phrase that has showed up repeatedly throughout the Bible, indicating what God is up to ultimately with his creation. There's this concept of the seed, and it starts in Genesis chapter 3, the very first chapters of the Bible. We call it the fall of humanity, where we reject God and Adam and Eve turn away from God, and we say, they say, we don't, we don't really like your input here. We'll be our own God. We'll decide what's right and wrong. We don't really need you. Thank you very much. You can just step aside here. We'll make our own choices. And they, they fall into sin, and it has these you know, ramifications for everything. And God begins to speak, and he says, here's, here's the outcome of that way of rejecting me. And he, he pronounces these curses. But then in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, he declares something, and we call it the proto-gospel, the proto like the first instance of the gospel showing up in the Bible. Here's what it is. Eve, you're going to have a seed 
a child, and that child is going to crush the head of the serpent. All these terrible things are happening, but you also need to know this. This is a word of grace in that word of judgment. He says, but there will be a seed, and that seed will undo all of this. That seed will crush the head of the serpent. You keep moving forward in the Bible, and that language is picked up again. God says it to a man named Abraham, who becomes the father of the Israelites. He says to Abraham, your seed, and he describes the blessings that are going to come to the nations through Abraham's descendants, the seed. And by the time we get to the New Testament, the Apostle Paul is able to put it like this. Galatians 3, we'll put it up on the screen. The Apostle Paul recognizes this idea of seed traveling throughout the Bible, and he connects the dots for us. He says, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say into seeds, meaning many people, but into your seed, meaning one person, Christ. You see, when they, when they, I would say, inspired by the Spirit, speak that word to Haman, and they go, oh boy, we're in trouble here, you're in trouble here, your downfall has started because you're going against Mordecai, and he is of the seed. What they're acknowledging is, he's a He's a part of what God is doing ultimately in this world in which we live. God is ultimately promising to undo the work of evil, to undo the work of wicked people who want to do harm to others. Through Jesus Christ, God has a plan to one day ultimately make all things right again, to set things as they ought to be. And so this story pulls us into that grand story of what God is up to with his creation. He is sending his son, Jesus Christ, to be deliverance for the people who will look to him and entrust their lives to him. As we look at this story, then, we're reminded of the fact that God is able to save. And he has done that most prominently, most significantly, most importantly, in the sending of his son, Jesus Christ. That the seed is Jesus Christ who is able to deliver us from sin, death, and evil. So as we conclude here this morning, we recognize that God has sent his son to be our salvation, and it it should change the things that we worship. It should change idolatry into true worship, that we recognize Jesus as our Savior, and we should see his providence then as the handiwork of God in our lives, that God is at work bringing all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. So here in Esther chapter 6, we're reminded of our Savior and his goodness toward us. So let's worship him right now. Let's pray. Lord, we ask right now that you would help each of us to identify the, the idols of our hearts, the things that we so badly want, and we try to convince ourselves that if we had it, life would be great. But without it, we just can't live. Instead, Lord, would you help us to replace those expressions of false worship with the true and living God, with our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let him be on the throne of our hearts and and let that change everything about us. And let us recognize your handiwork in this world, your providence, your ability to to work behind the scenes, even imperceptibly, Lord. We, We don't always see what you're doing, but you are at work for our good. Help us to trust that. Help us to believe that. Help us to live in light of that reality, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.